Uh, well, good morning everyone. My name is uh, Daniel. I am uh, currently the senior pastor of Faith Community Baptist uh, Church. And um, well, over the last two years, it's been a very interesting journey. I shared my uh, journey about my struggles with mental health uh, at various settings, especially in the Love Singapore setting earlier in the year. And with that, uh, Pastor Sing Lee graciously invited me to join in, uh, to share my journey with this session. But uh, to kind of share a lot more about it, it requires me to share a bit more about my, myself. So um, I, I took on the role as a senior pastor of our church in 2019. I took on this role from my father, Pastor Lawrence Kong, who had been a senior pastor for well, all the time before that, since uh, the church was founded. And, um, well, a lot, a lot of people always thought that it would be quite natural or quite normal for me to take on this role to become a pastor. Uh, but I think what a lot of people don't realize is that actually every day being a pastor for me, it's a very conscious effort that I have to make. Uh, it's not as convenient as what a lot of people uh, uh, think. And I've heard a lot of things said about me by uh, other people before. Uh, oh, you know, it's easy because he, he can't do anything else. It's just easy for him to take over the father's uh, uh, role. Uh, the word nepotism has been thrown up in our, in our church before as well. Uh, but maybe this is my journey. Um, I'm someone who, I, I don't mean this in a negative way, but I'm, I'm very sensitive or rather particular about words. You talk about the, the different love languages. Words of affirmation is my, uh, uh, my language of love, uh, which means the language, uh, means, which means uh, the language to hurt me would also be words. So that's why I'm very particular uh, about that. So having grown up as a pastor's kid, um, uh, again, like I said, it's not necessarily just very convenient that a pastor's kid will one day become a pastor. I always say this about pastor's kids. Uh, two options. Pastor's kids are either on fire for God or they are burning down the world. Uh, that's usually what <laughs> you can notice. Um, I, I see that in, in, in our own family as well. But I remember when I was growing up, I actually, I, I wanted nothing more than to be just like my dad. I wanted to be a pastor. I wanted to preach. I love uh, being in the church. I, I followed my dad to all his conferences, whether in Singapore or around the world. Uh, uh, yeah, I would just be with, with, with him. But over the years, something else developed in me. And uh, instead of a love for the church, I developed a very strong hatred for, for the church. I shared my testimony many times and it always starts with this one line. I say, I hate the church. Uh, that was how I grew up because... Uh, a lot of negative words started being said. I remember I went to a, a, a mission school and uh, you would think that being a mission school would be very helpful for a pastor's kid. Actually, it was anything but. Um, my teachers would often scold, this, uh, scold me and I was not a good student. I didn't do well. I forgot to, bring, uh, forgot to bring my homework and that kind of thing. And they always scold me. And uh, one, one thing that uh, one teacher always repeated to me that never, never, I never forgot uh, she said this to me, she said, how can you behave like this? Don't you know that you're Lawrence Kong's son? Uh, I, I heard this and, and I, I mean, it's moments like that I kind of wish that I would go to a non-Christian school instead, but that was what I heard and I heard it from other teachers uh, before. I heard it from leaders in the church before as well. And so that, that, that slowly kind of developed a certain resentment towards the church. And it didn't help that over time, um, my father was in the ministry, my mother then joined the ministry as well, and more and more my family joined the ministry. And, and I remember when I, was, uh, when I was 16 years old, my whole family disappeared. Okay? My, my parents were both traveling a lot for the ministry, my sister went along with them, my other sister was in university, my, other, my brother was in the army. So very often I was at home alone by myself, myself, our, our helper, plus my grandmother, and that was my O levels year, and I kind of struggled a lot. And I hated it. I felt that the church robbed me of my family. And I but I never dared to speak about it because I feel like the moment I speak about it, then it's like I'm sinning or, or it's not right for me to say uh, that. I remember one day I was at a prayer meeting before uh, my dad and mom would go off for a couple of months and a leader went up to the... They said, let's get some leaders up on the stage to pray for them. And, and this leader came up, you know. Uh, they said, oh, Pastor Lawrence and Nina, we, we thank God for you and we just want to say this the whole, as the church we release you, we give you permission to go and everything. And I, I was at the back of the hall and I was fuming. I was very angry because I thought, who gave them permission to give permission to my parents to go? I said, you're not the ones going home to an empty house and, and, and so on. And so I, I struggled and I, this hatred just became deeper and deeper. When I was 17 or 18, I went to a conference and the, Lord, the Holy Spirit convicted me. And the Holy Spirit said, you know, Daniel, you need to, you need to go talk to your parents about this and you need to ask for forgiveness. I said, why ask? For, I, if anything, the church, I, I remember I told God this, I said, the church 
should get on their knees and beg me for forgiveness. <laughs> That's what I said. <laughs> and uh, God said, no, but you, you go and you repent. You repent for harboring hatred towards the bride of Christ. So I talked to my parents about it and I repented and, and all that. And, and that, that was my journey. That, and it's been an ongoing journey. It was an ongoing journey in my whole life to learn how to love the church. When I finished my time in uh, national service, I came out, I became a staff of the church, I became a pastoral intern in our church immediately. I've served there for 13 years uh, right now. Uh, every year is a journey to learn how to love the church. I, uh, as I become more aware of leadership issues in the church, I now also begin to hear more and more things being said about my family, my parents and everything. I start to hear all these funny things. So it was always a, a, a big tension. And after a couple of years on, on the staff team, I spoke to my dad. I said, Dad, I know you have some idea eventually you want me to be a senior pastor. But I said, I don't think I can ever be that senior pastor. I can be a deputy senior pastor. I can be an operations guy. I can do anything else but be the senior pastor. And he says, why? I says, because I don't know how to love the church. And I don't think I ever can. And my dad, in all his wisdom, he said something very deep to me. He just looked at me and said, Daniel, you just got to. That's all he said. <laughs> and I was like, okay, that makes it a lot simpler. But, but, um, but the thing is, I, I, I went through a lot of that in my journey. And... I have grown a lot in learning how to love the church. Now, why is this important? This is important because um, years ago, I uttered these words in front of the church. I said, I love my church. I love the church. I love the bride of Christ. I love FCBC. I've never dared to say that in my life before. And when I said that, that was when my dad and mom said, he's ready to be the senior pastor. And finally, when I did become the senior pastor, I truly love this church. I, I cry for our church a lot. I, I, I care for our church a lot. But that's when the last two years, COVID hit. I took on this role of senior pastor end of 2019. And then, uh, yeah, everyone's <laughs> laughing at that. So we had a lot of plans. All these plans had to be scrapped because 2020 hit. And once 2020 hit, um, like I said, I've, I've grown, I've leveled up in different areas of learning how to love the church. But 2020 started a whole new lesson on how to love the church even more. So at the start of uh, the pandemic, I had people writing in to me because you know, everything was, I, in fact, I was actually overseas. We were ministering in Japan. I was getting a lot of emails from the church because the pandemic was, was kind of starting here in Singapore. And people were writing to me and saying, Pastor Daniel, you need, to, you need to close down the church. You need to shut down the church and, uh, and, and this and that. And, and I remember one, one particular leader wrote in to me and said, Pastor Daniel, um, I, I'm okay for people to write in to me and give me suggestions and ideas, but they tend to personalize it. So I said, Pastor Daniel, uh, why haven't you shut down the church? There's a pandemic going around. How can you as a senior pastor not give a concern for your flock? Do you not love your church? That's what, it was an email that came in. And so we came back, we deliberated, and, and I remember I, I came back, and at that point in time, it was quite early on. So I preached a message. I preached a message called Risky Faith. I said, you know what, we must be faithful. We continue to meet as a church. But shortly after that, there were some very close cases in our church. In fact, our whole children's ministry had to, our staff had to be put on quarantine for a short period of time. So I said, it's going a bit crazy. Let's suspend our services. And then this whole other set of emails came in. Someone wrote in and said, Pastor Daniel, as a senior pastor, how can you be a man who lacks faith? You have no faith at all. And so that, that, that went on. And in the pandemic, there's a lot of ups and downs. A lot of these things was, were, were said. Um, I remember at, at one point of, of time, in, the, in 2020 to 2021, out of the uh, 106 weekends, I think I preached about 99 uh, uh, of them. Uh, we have other preaching pastors, who, but they have other duties as well, and they actually look after certain teams of a few hundred people in the church. And uh, they had brought up reports to me that a lot of people were struggling. Marriages were breaking down, families were breaking down. So I said, you know what, you guys go and serve your, your people. Go and care for them, meet them, go to the hospital. I will, do, I will, I will take most of the preaching. And when we did that, week after week, emails started coming in. Why is Pastor Daniel hogging the limelight? He, has, he doesn't believe in empowering his people. He's arrogant. He doesn't yet. And these are the emails I got. And, and every single day, I would be getting these kinds of emails or texts and, and so on. People started attacking me. They started attacking my wife. They started saying a lot of different things. Uh, one leader, uh, again, threw up the whole card about uh, nepotism. And it was a big struggle. I went into a period of uh, struggling in my mental health. Uh, I was consciously very anxious. Um, during that period, I, I, I suffered from great insomnia. So like over uh, the weekend, by the time I'm um, 
by the time I'm done preaching on a Sunday, I actually have not slept in maybe 20 to 30 hours because I just can't sleep. Every time I lie down, I cannot sleep. I see people's faces. And some of these people who write to me, I know them. Okay? And some of the people who said the most hurtful things, I, well, one couple said hurtful things about me and my wife. I married them and I did their marriage preparation course. I've journeyed together with them for years. I know I see these faces and it, it was a big struggle for me. And uh, I was consciously very anxious. My wife said I was not myself. Um, when we went for meetings in the church, I was always uh, on my toes. I was always like trying to tiptoe around things. I was always worried of making the wrong decision because everyone had something to say about me. And I always thought, I, I felt it reached a point where I feel like I can't even breathe wrongly. You know, it, it, it was that, uh, that was really the situation. So, I struggled a lot with that. Um, there was one time I was out doing groceries and I was just pushing the, the trolley and suddenly the whole grocery store started spinning and I almost passed out. I actually kind of tipped over and I had to grab a railing to stand. I went back home, I told my mom, who my mom used to be a, a, a GP. So she said, um, can I take your blood pressure? And she discovered that my blood pressure was through the roof uh, for, for I think maybe close to an entire year. She made me do it regularly and monitor. My blood pressure was significantly higher than hers or my dad's, okay? And they have high blood pressure. And so I was constantly feeling lightheaded. I was always uh, struggling uh, all the time. And it took a great toll on me, basically. And, and I remember it reached a point of time. What, what really transformed me was when there was a prayer session with some Love Singapore pastors, particularly uh, Pastor Derek Hong. Pastor Derek Hong, uh, they, we had some planning session and they knew that I missed out on the session because I had great insomnia. I, I, uh, there was one planning meeting where I joined in only in the afternoon because that whole night I had not slept a wink, I, so they excused me. But when I went in for that time, there was, there was a small group time of prayer. We were supposed to pray for the pandemic, I mean pray uh, that, you, that things will turn around and everything. But instead, all of them decided to pray for me. And they released a lot of words, they released words uh, over me saying, you know, uh, Daniel, you are, you, are, you are chosen and everything, you are one that God has appointed and he ministered to me. And I remember after that, Pastor Derek, he stayed on after that prayer session. He spoke to me for another extra one hour. Actually, he didn't really speak much. He just listened. He didn't prescribe anything. He didn't tell me, Daniel, what you need to do is go and pray three times a day. You need to read your Bible, go and read this book. Well, no, he just, he just listened and I poured out my heart to him. I poured out my spirit. I cried and, and he just listened and he just encouraged me and he just told me keep, uh, keep going on and he said anytime you want you will pray we can listen to you and and so on and that kind of changed my perspective too. I, I felt like i was not uh like like i was not alone uh uh, uh just now remember dr tan you're talking about having a community i mean that was a great changing thing for me that i was not uh, uh alone and for once i felt like i was in a community where people were not ready to stone me uh but of course i mean i'm not saying everything is bad i mean that and I guess the thing is, you know, when it comes to your mental health, people can say to you a hundred good things, but that one thing is what tears you down. All the negative things in the church, I'm not saying our church is a bad place. I mean, in fact, these are probably small groups of people, but they tend to be the loudest. Uh, you know, when, I, when I'm done preaching on the weekend, right, the people who were really ministered to, they don't, they don't often come up to me and say, hey, pastor, that's a great message. But the people who think it was a bad message... Those are the ones who will come up to you and say, you know, I think you didn't, this point, second point, third point, they send you a whole uh, thesis on why your sermon was not the best and everything. So that, that was, was how it is. And I remember that really ministered to me because one underlying thought I had in the last two years was with the pandemic, people are complaining. I sensed like there was unhappiness. I saw that, you know, the church was not exactly growing. In fact, it was shrinking uh, during the pandemic. Of course, there's a lot of concerns. And the question I had, I asked myself is this, Am I the man to bring the downfall of FCBC? And that was a question that kept circulating in my mind. But it was when I met up with these other pastors and they spoke to me, they imparted into me and, and they, they, they encouraged me along. And I think that was really the change. And after that, uh, I remember I said, enough is enough. And, and uh, I told my wife, said, all these things, people saying, all these things, I'm done playing games. <laughs> okay? uh, I'm done playing all these things because... I've got a church to lead. I've got a church to minister. We've got people to be cared for. So I actually sat down with all our leaders. I said, I know a lot of you are unhappy at me. People are unhappy at me because I'm too different from my father. People are happy at me because I'm too similar to my father as well. I sat down with all of them. I said, I'm drawing the line. If you're unhappy, please find somewhere else you can be happy, somewhere you can contribute. I, I'm, I'm fine with that. Okay? But if you're going to stay, let's stay and let's build this community. So, well, since I had that, honest talk with the whole church. Everything has changed. Uh, a lot of them are, I mean, by God's grace, a lot of them, those who have stayed on, they are staying on because they want to. 
Some have left, and I'm happy for them. Find somewhere else that you can, you can settle down. But yeah, that's really, I guess, in a nutshell, my journey in the last uh, two years. It's still something I'm going, going through. But I would say this, in the last two years, uh, my wife has been a big help. She has, every, she has helped me be more aware of what are my triggers or, or when I'm spiraling. And she has helped me to be a lot more uh, vocal about it. She says, Daniel, talk to me when you are feeling. So I, one thing I know is um, I'm, I become very irritable when I'm spiraling. And once you see me getting irritable, within the next day or so, I'm out of control. I will, I will be like, I'll, I'll be reclusive. I will not talk to anybody and everything. So she helps me spot all this. Another thing that my wife made me do, she tells me, get out of the house. She said, go for a run. If you can't run, just walk. Go and do something. And I realized after, remember the circuit breaker period, uh, she forced me out to go on a walk. And I realized at the end of circuit breaker, I said, I have not looked up at the sky in a couple of months. It, because I get in the car, I drive to church, I preach, and then I drive back home. But I walked out and I realized I searched so much. And, and God is so much bigger than everything. God is so much bigger than the problems that we face and, and all. And I just found that I could find that that connection with the Lord once, uh, once again. So there's a lot more I can say, but I guess let me just end it here in a nutshell. That's what uh, it is. Uh, thank you all. Good to see you. And your father's old friend. Oh, yeah. Bless you. Bless you. Often the people that are most hurt and least loved are the shepherds because a lot of sheep bite. <laughs> and so I think we all have experienced bites, huh? And uh, that was a very good, authentic sharing. I really appreciate it. I, I hope you begin to see the, the climate we're trying to create here, to be a transparent environment where we can really share our journey together. So with that, I want to pass the time now to Pastor Valerie Chan to come and share the journey as well. Thank you.